Welcome back to In Light of the Gospel, episode 10. Ten times already that I've posted a conversation. It's been a real joy and a pleasure for me. I really hope you're getting something out of it and have been blessed by it. I see people are subscribing to the channel and liking the videos, so it must mean something. But uh, as we go, I'm slowly getting an office prepared that'll be kind of a more permanent setup, and then hopefully the quality of recordings will go up and up. Seems like sometimes I'm kind of going backwards. I had some decent recordings for a while, now this one actually you'll notice, and I do apologize, nothing I can do about it now. The content is too good for me not to put it out. But I ended up recording it in our camping trailer. It was a rainy day. The furnace ends up coming on. You'll, you'll hear that in the background. I tried to edit it out a little bit as, be as well as I could, but uh, please bear with it. I think, uh, I think you'll still be really blessed by this, uh, this conversation. So this is a guy that I've just recently come to know a little bit better. I knew him a little bit in my childhood, but he's a young friend of mine named Tony Fair, his brother. I recorded a conversation with Tony some time back. His older brother, John, who was highly, highly addicted to methamphetamines for a long time, nine years, uh, to the point where he was out of the home uh, for a number of years where he couldn't see his wife and his family, to where at the end, just before he got free from it, he was on the verge of losing it all again, losing his wife, losing his family. He had no job. He had he had gone so low that he was dumpster diving routinely, and this was just his life. And and there was no will for him from him to be able to get free. He was completely, completely stuck, and God set him free. Now it took some persuasion, it took some pressure from friends and from family and from people around, but he, he's super grateful now. And I think you'll be able to tell from his countenance, from his uh, his his way of speaking, that he is really free. He is joy filled and uh, he's been walking free for a few months now two months I think probably and uh, he's reading his Bible like crazy he's uh, loving his family and he's learning he's growing he's got things to change like all of us but it's incredible to see someone walk free from methamphetamines after that long of use so I really appreciate you tuning in hopefully you'll be blessed by this God bless this is John Fair maybe some of you guys remember Tony Fair a few episodes back this is his older brother um, he just recently came back from a rehab stint in BC, and uh, before that, you spent how many years highly addicted to drugs and substance? Um, methamphetamine would have been, I think, nine years. Nine years of steady methamphetamine yeah. use, and in that time, your life became a complete disaster. I've heard you tell your story a little bit before, but before we get into the crazy parts, I'd like to just kind of go back and see what was it growing up? What was it like growing up? You were the second oldest? The second oldest, yep. My oldest brother is Frank, and then and Abe, and Pete, and Tony, and Tony, Anna. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, growing up was awesome. I like I was incredibly blessed with an awesome set of parents. My dad was super straightforward, you know, hardworking, never did anything too selfish. It was all about, you know, providing, providing and, and for doing, the family, you know, the basics and making sure he didn't necessarily never have a lot of money, but we had enough money. Mm -hmm. And he always sacrificed. He was always sacrificial. And, you know, if he did something, he did it because he, he thought it was right. Yeah. He didn't ever do anything just because he thought it was good for him. So in that sense, I, you know, I had an awesome childhood. And me and my dad, we were pretty much best friends. Like, I would, I would consider it that way anyways. Like, wherever dad went, I went. I was always, you know, whenever he needed a 916 wrench, I would go get it for him. Okay. And whenever he was, we were done working on stuff, I would go and test drive it. I would get to go with him, and it'd be clean up, and I would do that for him. And, and um, actually, growing up, I remember, because I, I loved driving. I really loved driving, and my dad had bought a new tractor, a new long tractor. So I literally hauled him all around the yard. It took about two hours just so I could drive it into the garage. But then the benefit for him was whatever was in front of him, I always cleaned up. Yep. So, and then I was always right there behind him. And we did this <laughs> summer after summer after summer. It turns out later on that the other kids that were jealous that I always got to spend so much time with dad. And I was kind so, of similar interests. Right? Yeah, I, I argued while, well, you know, I cleaned up literally everything for him. So, I mean, it was beneficial for not only just for me, but for him as well. Right? So I knew your dad a little bit just because I was in Sunday school. Now, I know when you're a kid, sometimes you have 
perspective of adults that's not quite accurate. Because now I've been told sometimes that I can be very intimidating to people. Some kids are afraid to come to me, maybe, or even other people just sometimes don't know how to approach me. Yeah. Your dad seemed very stern. Oh, he was. And often really quick to be angry and oh, all yeah. that. Like yeah. I would purposely push buttons in Sunday school. Yeah, I, I was a little brat. I I was no good in school. Right. Yeah. Or in, in Sunday school, me and John Bannon and Willie Simon yeah, were Willie perhaps Simon. always yeah. causing trouble. Right. It's, so. not, it's not Siemens. My dad would always say Siemens. Oh yeah. Say, no, it's, it's Simons. Yeah. Just spell pie, and then he would correct him. And my dad was like, he didn't, he didn't. Siemens. Yeah, yeah, he, he didn't like that. But anyway, he seemed really stern and, and difficult to deal with. But it sounds like you got along pretty well with him. Yeah, yeah, all the way until it came up to um, teenage years. Okay. You know, then it was, uh, it was a bit more. I wanted to do things my way, and I wanted to, you know, grow up at my pace. I didn't want to grow up at his pace. He was always trying to maybe hold me back more. And I was obviously a teenager. I wanted to, you know, explore the world and, and see, you know, and I thought I knew everything, so I, there was nothing more to me, for me to learn from him. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of go my own route. And so me and my dad, we clashed a lot during the teenage years. So like from 13, 14 already, or more like the 15, 16? 15, right? 16, yeah. Okay. Whenever it came to car or money, that was our, our big, oh, I see. big thing. But um, we kind of did, I moved out a little early. I was 17, I moved out. And so that kind of put a, a big dent in our relationship. But we did rekindle a little bit. And so we got kind of back to when, when I got married and everything else. And I got baptized in the old colony and then was on his good graces again. So that was a big thing. And then so we got along well until he found out about my drug use. And then it kind of I see. It was really bad. So you moved out at 17. Yeah. And you moved into your own apartment? Or? Yeah, I moved in with my brother Frank. Oh, okay. Which is also a very bad thing to do because him and Frank were always buddy Always heads. clashing, yeah. even from young on. Oh, yeah, they never... absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Frank was more of a book type, and my dad was more, you know, get the wrench and do the job. And my brother Frank was always intellectual. And, and you were the hard-working yeah. contractor type of guy. You'd yeah, go so out I'd... and fix things. And I mean, Frank worked hard, too. Yeah, oh, he's, and he still does. He's Actually, now he's probably one of the hardest-working guys in the family, which... Strange, eh? It doesn't make sense with, you know, the way he thinks and the way he works. It's, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense for me, really. But, I mean, he, and he really puts in a lot of effort. But yeah. It's not really, I, do, I like working hard, but I, I also like to play Spend hard. Spend more time with the yeah, family. Relax. And your kids and are growing kind of up stuff. fast. Yeah. So at 17, you moved out, and you and Frank living together. Was it immediate that you started into, like, party scenes, or? No, actually, um, because at the time, he was still very much Christian, right? And so he was always going to youth groups and stuff like that and we went to uh, uh, it was in Cambridge the rollerblading place we oh, went yeah. there a lot and so the odd yeah the odd yeah because of him I actually I spent a lot of time with Christians okay because we, we ended up being in the same circle and our, our friends weren't at the time they weren't they weren't really Christian, but they weren't really rebellious either. So kind of a middle ground there a little bit. And so we weren't, it wasn't then yet. Um, I only started actually smoking smoking marijuana, I think it was 17. So that's what it yeah, started with. That's what it started, yeah. But that wasn't with Frank, that was with no, other that was, that was with my brother Abe. Yeah, my brother Abe introduced me to it on wow. a family vacation. And yeah, never, never thought it was going to escalate into what it did, but it did. And uh, yeah, so that was that was my marijuana. That was for years. The hard stuff didn't really come until later on in life. Like so it wasn't like period. marijuana immediately brought you to the hard no, type of drugs. No, no, not at all. For me, it wasn't a gateway. I mean. Yeah, I don't think it was a gateway for me. Maybe intellectually, psychologically, where it yeah. opened you up yeah. to being okay with taking illegal substances. Yeah, absolutely. But in not that, sense, that yes. it created a need in you to want more. No, no. It was uh, more social social situations that put me in that. But yeah, I guess there would have been that acceptance of, of the, the toxic substances. I mean, you know, that never killed me before, so what was the, what was the damage, right? So when it's you illegal, know? not a big deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So then when you started that, then was it uh, with buddies hanging out or you were just your brother, you said? Um, yep, the marijuana was mostly with my brother. And then we obviously, we got to know some people that were in that same circle. Yeah. And say so hang out with them. And that was quite a few years like that. And then I ended up getting married. And I didn't quit. I was supposed to. I should have, but I didn't quit. I just kind Can of... Can you how do you elaborate a little bit? How did you meet Lena? Uh, actually, at a New Year's Eve party. 
Okay. Which is kind of different for a, a couple to be, you know, in love and stuff like that. And, you know, New, New Year's Eve party. But yeah, we met. We met at a party. Um, I hadn't been dating for anybody. I hadn't seen anybody for a year. So I was. I was completely against the whole relationship thing. I was going to do my own thing. And then I went to a party just enjoying myself. And then I met her. And everything changed. Yeah, I just like, <laughs> fell in love right away, almost wow. instantly. And it was uh, a really bad way to party, or bad way to meet. But the next day, we, we soberly talked, and, and she was baptized. And so, you know, I kind of felt like she had a, a bit of a grounds. You know, a good ground to stand on, you know, kind of thing. And eventually I knew it was the way I wanted to go anyway. Yeah. I didn't want to always be a bad kid. I always wanted to be a good kid. I just wanted to keep Until the bad, you get married. Yeah. Right? Keep the bad things, you know, secret. You know, that's kind of, you know, the way I find it. You know, I wasn't going to let everybody know about my bad things. I just right. wanted to, you know, kind of have them for myself. And, uh, yeah, so then uh, we ended up dating and we were in a, she lived in Listowel and I lived in Elmer. And so... There was always that distance, so we only really saw each other on the weekends. So there was, it was a really good relationship builder because we weren't, even though we were factuated with each other, we didn't get to spend too much time. You together. weren't constantly with each other physically, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas so there was other temptations. Yeah, you exactly. actually got to know each other's minds and hearts. Yeah. We call each other a lot and stuff like that. But then that also gave the avenue for for sin, for secret sin, right? For my you, you know, could I, keep things. Yeah, I didn't yeah. I didn't have to quit necessarily because five days of the week I was myself, and then two days of the week I was able to you know make sure I was good enough for her. I see. And so that was kind of a it was a good thing for our relationship, but it was a bad thing for me personally. So. In a sense, if you think of, like, I know a little bit of your history and how you, you would often kind of skirt around what you were doing, right? You would yeah. try to avoid letting everybody know. So your relationship with her kind of started on that grounds already. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a bit yeah. of a bad leg to start on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it definitely, the di my, my dishonest part in our relationship, I would say if it didn't hold 100% of it, I would say it probably held 90% of all of our faults because I... Looking back now, if I would have started off right, yeah, all those things that we went through, uh, the hardships that we went through, they all would have been, would have been avoided. Which is simple, honestly. Amazing. Just, that's that's pretty much so, it. So, like, basically, what you're saying is that dishonesty started you down a path to almost ending your life, almost yep. ruining your marriage, almost losing your kids, yep. almost ending up homeless, yep. and ending up in jail or prison a couple times, yep. things like that. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. You actually. think, well, it's just a small sin. It's just well, a it's simple just, lie, right? It's a lie. And then... Or maybe not even a lie, just not telling the whole truth. Yeah, keeping it a secret, right? Yeah. But then, uh, and it's... Uh, it's funny, actually, you mentioned jail. Yesterday, it was at, uh, at, at our lunch, we were having... Um, I forget what Eric had, but I had a sandwich, and he was saying that... Um, uh, Will, my boss's lunch, looked really good. And I said, well, so does mine. It's a sandwich, right? And my take on that was it was a really nice sandwich compared to the sandwiches I used to get in jail okay. so you know it was just like even you can still just, always compare to yeah, that just eh? a little tiny sandwich but it was nothing special but I mean I had multi-grain bread in, in jail you don't get I had mayonnaise you don't get that in jail I had cheese you don't get that in jail like all these little things that you don't get yeah. and that yeah that all that avenue all started with that you know secret secrecy and you and at the time I never thought of it as being that bad yeah like you know, I knew I wanted to be a Christian. I knew I wanted to be a good person. I just didn't want it bad enough. Right. Jesus says, He that loves the light comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest. Yeah. But those that hate the light, they stay away from it. They yeah. want their deeds to stay, right? Most exactly. people even that are atheists, that claim to be atheists, if you really can talk to them long enough to where they let you know what they really feel, yeah. usually they're, they don't want their life messed with. Yeah, there's a hidden... There's I'm a enjoying hidden this yeah. too much... For God to be real means this has to be exposed. I don't want to go yeah. there. And I've, I've actually I've noticed that too. Um, um, certain uh, people in my life now that are, are, you know, maybe once were a little bit more Christian and now they've kind of faded away. And they don't see it, but I see it as, you know, the reason that, you know, you don't necessarily want to go and, and give up and, and become a Christian is because you're going to have to let go of all the sin. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it might be publicly accepted the sin, you know, with relationships and what have you, but, you know, when you're looking at it in like a biblical view, you're definitely not going down the right path. Right. You know, and so if you were to, you know, follow Jesus, then you definitely have to let go of this, and they don't want to do that. Yeah.
So you met Lena when you were 17, 18? Uh, no, actually 21. 21. Yeah, oh, 21. So you spent a few years away from home. Yep. yep. From 17 yep. to 21. Well, in the meantime, I did go back at one point. Okay. I think I was out for about two years, and then I ended up coming with... Uh, I was supposed to move, and I was... I went to my parents, and I said, well, I'm either going to move to St. Thomas or I'm going to move home. And so my dad... Not very graciously, he accepted me back in the home. Okay. Yeah. Was he like a lot of Mennonite dads where they give you that ultimatum saying, if you ever leave, you're never coming back? That was his thing, yeah. Okay. And so it was a very nerve wracking conversation to have with me. Usually that threat is enough to, to keep, keep the kids home. home right? Right? Yeah. And <laughs> my dad, he was like one of those people, he didn't, he never really went back on his word. So whatever he said, you know, stuff. Yeah. Just like my dad has always said, if you go to jail, I'm never going to bail you up. Right. And he stuck to that really well. Up. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yeah, he wasn't gonna let up on that one. But the moving home thing, yeah, he did let that. Wow. And he's he's thankful. probably much more loving and generous. I know Tony's told me about how generous he is in many cases. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. right. So a lot of times I may maybe I saw him as kind of hard and mean. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's probably very tender and yeah. really does love his and kids. And with age, he has gotten a lot softer. For sure. Like I was talking to my brother Abe a little while ago at a family gathering. He's like, I don't even know this dad anymore. Like, he plays with cats now. Yeah. Like, my dad is not a cat playing kind of like what we know him. You know, if there's a cat, it's like, you better run because here comes my dad, right? Yeah. You know, if it goes in the house or in the vehicle, it's, it's that cat is going to be ruined, right? Interesting. And now, you know, he's got a favorite cat. Which is just, you know, that shows his heart is <laughs> softened like crazy. Like, and probably favorite. plays with the grandkids yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I know uh, it seems like everybody does that a little bit, right? Like, I can be kind of stern and I'm slowly getting softer. By the time I'm a grandpa, I'm sure I'll be different. But it seems like especially our parents' generation, yeah. some, somehow in Mexico, they were raised hard. Oh, like, they were. Raised you really you hard. work like this, or yeah. you you know you're nothing, right? Exactly. And so they came here very stern, very hard. They don't play with kids, likely. They don't. No. You know, they're not hugging their families oh, or no, yeah. telling them that they love them or anything yeah. like that. It's just like even now, like me and my dad, we hug now, right? Not all the time, but right. on certain here occasions, and right? And you can there's still that you know resistance, right? But you know he does it because he loves me, and he's always been fairly supportive of all my good decisions or the better decisions and stuff like that and he does show a good heart towards it but he's, he's got to be relieved yeah. now where you are now eh? he is but it, he's still feared not like sure. he, he's still scared because and I understand that too as a dad I mean you know the last thing I would ever want for my kids to stand up in that, that type of lifestyle yeah and so for him to you know know now that it's over but he, you know, he's still kind he of holding just, you at arm's length. Yeah. I don't know if like, this is. Yeah. Are you just you know, saying things? Because I've done that too. If I'm completely right. honest, yeah, I've been watching it. I've been kind of observing. Everyone has. You know, <laughs> like I, I know John's made some professions before. Yeah. He's he's come out of things and then gone back to it. Yeah. But this, so far from what I can tell, this is nothing like any of your previous well, so-called it really isn't changes. Because now it's I'm not doing it myself. Yeah. You know, on my own, I can play a, a skit a so so long. And then I'll, I'll, I'll cave. Right. But now it's not me playing It's been kid. a few it's, months. Yeah, it's Jesus. It's literally mm-hmm. Jesus. He's doing everything for me. And I, I give, you know, all the credit where credit is due. Jesus, if it wasn't for the gospel, if it wasn't for Jesus, you know, doing his work, I would have failed. Like, right. me, if I would have came back without Jesus from rehab, I probably would have lasted three days. Right. Maybe. You know, given my personality, I'm very much... I have an addictive, addictive personality, so when I like something, I like it a lot. I overdo it, and that's always been my case, and I've always known that to be my case. Yeah. And um, it's just, it, it just doesn't, it goes without failing. Now you have a choice. I remember talking about you before you left for rehab, thinking, I was saying, like, he, he cannot choose differently. Yeah. Like, as much as you wanted to be free one day, yeah. all of a sudden your body takes over and you can't even think, like the, the, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, the thing that I hate, that do I. Mm-hmm. The, you know, mm-hmm. the thing that I would not, that's what I end up doing. Yep. And the thing that I want to do, I just can't do it. I don't yep. find it in me. So I could see already from, from your track record, he doesn't have a choice. Yeah. He is so hooked on this stuff that he cannot do otherwise, right? Well, and that, for that, you that to now recognize, I can choose differently. Yeah. Because you could still walk after your flesh. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you the know? temptation is, is just as much readily available there as it ever was. Right. Because I still know where to go, what to do, who to talk to, what to say. And it would be within 20 minutes I'd be just like back that. in the same lifestyle. I look at the cost now and it just it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Amen. You know, like, so now I have conversations with my kids about salvation and, and what, you know, their future is going to look like. And I'm talking to my oldest about girlfriends and stuff like that. And my take on that would have been way different before it would have sure. been you know 
you go ahead and you do your fleshly desires and then you know you know hopefully one day you get married and everything will just kind of work out but now it's you know coaching them on you know relationships and what to do and what to expect the good and the bad and, and all that sort of thing amazing I know one thing that I was always kind of had a resentment against my parents because they they made it look really easily like my mom is a very submissive very woman, compliant and my dad is very like okay just look the over up and just look the over up and that's it right yeah and so I just thought naturally like you know I'm gonna find a wife that's gonna be very submissive and very you know <laughs> love everything that I do and I'm just gonna do the right thing and it's gonna be great right and like as far as raising the kids and stuff I always had a pretty good ground that way but with my wife she's a little bit more outspoken yeah. and in her family the women more so run the household or they they take care of things more a lot dominant, more. Yeah. yeah and so I wasn't I had no idea that was gonna happen and that happened right from the first day on, and I was I lost. I, I didn't know what to do with it, because I'd never encountered that before. I'd never had that kind of relationship before, let alone a relationship that you were stuck in or, like, you know, committed to. And so I, I didn't know what to do. Right. And especially with having just a worldview, not having a biblical view, yep. I was completely lost. Interesting. Because I couldn't say, well, Jesus says this, or the Bible says right. this, or this is how we're to live, because I had no idea. I'd never really read the so Bible. So right from day one, there was this, this head-on collision almost, right? right? Where you thought you were going to go in and be the leader and your wife would just quietly submit and then yeah. all of a sudden the reality is that she's, that way. she's not the I, way we came she back from her. Be, nor are you. Right? No. We came back from our, our wedding night or our wedding day. Um, we, we ended up, Actually, yeah, we did end up going to a, a, a place and we stayed a day and she wasn't feeling well so we, we just went back to life we just went to our apartment and we started and I get in the and I regularly just take off my shoes and I got yelled at right away so I'm like that's just this is not this what? is not right yeah like <laughs> put your shoes different okay I don't what <laughs> like this is and that's the way it started because you know she in her defense I think she saw where I was lacking and she was trying to pick yeah. up yeah. right so she was trying to you know make sure that I was gonna we're still gonna have a good household and I was I was just not having it I didn't wow. want it so I started fights immediately yeah 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 I tried to be as easy about it as possible but I was still young and I, I mm -hmm. was, you know, I had so did you get married at 21 yeah okay yeah I my understanding of what a marriage should be like you know God says this and then that's where it goes right, right. so I tried to play that card and it didn't work and so that was kind of it was a tough tough spell for a lot of years wow we were actually uh, 11 years married and then we separated for the first time and we were separated for three years that was a that was a really really tough period three years where you weren't living together no no and it was two and a half years where I couldn't see the children oh, on any kind of a regular like basis at all there's the children's aid thing that was there um, there was restrictions on her part because she was still angry I had uh, done some things before that that got her really angry yeah. and so it was her chance to take out her her revenge on me I guess and so I was very limited with the kids yeah. so what what led you to that first hit of major drugs like really addictive stuff um, well I had an instant I had a, a, a period where there was cocaine and that was um, something drove you to that yeah, cocaine. Was, uh, so I don't, I don't know. There was, uh, it was just like a, a social, social situation where it was put up, it was put in front of me, and I didn't really want to look like a fool. So I said, "Yeah, go for but it." But you were married yeah. already. Then I was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was in our earlier years of marriage. Have kid, it was um, Ethan born already? Eric. Eric, uh, sorry. No. Yes, he was actually. Yeah, he okay. was born then. Yeah, he was still a toddler, and so that was that. And I got away from that quickly because I realized it wasn't where I wanted to go with my life. Okay. But then a few years later, it, it popped up again, and having the past experience with it, well, it's no big deal. I shrugged I've it off done before. This before yeah. yeah, I can get rid of it. And turns out I couldn't get rid of it. Cocaine again? Yeah. And then when we separated, uh, that's when it became the mess. Well, I was at a. <clears throat> Uh, a friend of mine, John Newfold, has passed away now. Um, we were I was living at his house because he was the only one that would bail me out. So I was living at his house and we went to another friend's house and so we were just hanging out there and it was late and I was at the time I was already an alcoholic for say eight to ten years. And I was just exhausted. I wanted to go home. I had to work the next day and everybody else there they were still up and doing stuff and, and nobody really wanted to go home. And so I said, well, you know, what's going on? Like, if you guys don't want me to go home, 
but at least let me get in on what you guys are doing so I can be, you know, the same as you guys, right? Mm. And I'd heard about meth before. I'd heard that it was like a one-shot deal. You can't ever reverse it. And it's that's pretty much the truth. Really? Yeah, that's pretty much the truth, I would say. So cocaine you can walk away from? Yeah. It's hard. What what did cocaine do for you? Just kind of relieve you of life's pressures and all the. No, it did. It was a, it was more of a, a party thing. Really. You know, when you're when you want to get really out and, and outgoing and stuff, and that was. Oh, I see. You know, it loosens you yeah. up, frees you to be yeah social. Yeah, social. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And if you're. Did you sorry? Did you do this stuff? Only when you were w- away from your family. No, the cocaine stuff happened periodically before. Like even when you were with Lena. Yeah. In the yeah. same room. Yeah. No, no. No, it was so all go out with the guys. Yeah. It was all secret. Okay. Actually, she probably doesn't even know about all that, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was more before. Um, periodically, when you know things weren't going that well, and hanging out with the guys, and that, that kind of thing. That's when that happened. And then when we were separated, then that's when the meth happened. I was quite depressed. I was quite like lost. I didn't know what to do with myself, and so I was really accepting to anything and everything to get me out of the spot where I was, wow. mentally and emotionally. Just there was no way out. Like I mean, you you were living with like buddy now. Your family yep. can't you can't see them. You had actually been to jail. Yep. For a few nights. Yeah, a few nights and yep. And uh, I wasn't allowed to go home. I wasn't allowed to see my children. I wasn't allowed to go back to my house. Um, I mean, that that was even as a, with them. as a result of losing your temper at home. Yeah, being uh, maybe drunk or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was I was drunk and she wanted to go out and uh, spend some time with our sister in law, which they were going through a rough patch in their marriage, and I could see even in the state that I was, I could see that it was hindering our marriage. Mm-hmm. So I wanted her not to go, and especially during the week, and it was a, it was a school night, and it was like 11 o'clock, she was going to go and leave and go for coffee. And they never got together for coffee for our 11 years of marriage until they were having marriage problems, and then, so they were, I guess she so needed to... trying to grip tighter. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, just, no, no. This isn't, this isn't going to be good for us at all. Like, I knew we weren't in the best spot, but I knew that was going to make it worse, and it did make it worse. And so I was going to put my foot down and, you know, no, you're not leaving. And she said yes, and we got into a conversation, and it just escalated. Next thing you know, she's out the door, and she called my sister-in-law, and so my sister-in-law ended up picking her up and then taking her to the police station because she oh, was man. saying, you know, you have to make a statement. You have to, This has to be known. And really, my life wasn't up for it, but that's kind of the way it went. The pressure was there. And then, so my wife was now home. I put the kids to bed. Everything was fine that way. And I went to sleep. And all of a sudden, whatever time it was in the morning, I got woken up with the police. They put me in handcuffs and, and brought me outside, Jeez. put me in the cruiser, and it was over. Where, where do you think things really kind of started to spiral down? Was it kind of at that point, or maybe it was even way before? It was before that. Obviously, the way it even started, you being secretive about your drug use yep. is already the start. But when did things just get out of control? Um, it was... And this is this is something that probably not a lot of people know. Some people know um, is when I started to search outside of my marriage. When I started to search for for love outside of my marriage, mm-hmm. I I guess in my sad defense, I felt like I was in a loveless marriage for all my marriage, and so I was kind of looking for that. But then I was looking for it not in you know the right way. I was yeah. looking for it in other females, and so that's that's when it, that was my it really started like, going down. That was the nail of the coffin. See, the of. funny thing is, is sometimes Mennonites and especially you know staunch male dominant type of households, which I'm full support of a man being the head of the household. Yeah. But the way a man ought to lead is not by force and domination. No. Yeah. But by loving not. and yeah. serving, right? And so sometimes when a man doesn't know what to do, he's like, I'm just gonna be right. Yeah. I'm gonna be the man. So. And that's when stuff clashes like crazy, that's especially if you're. If you, if one is maybe if, if she would have had you know if she could have been, she have been sweet, saved, submissive if she would have been saved maybe it could have worked out that way I could have kind of right. gotten in the back door or that way you could have been yeah. the loving serving husband no matter what but with both of us not having a good a good base that way it was it was due for Bad disaster yeah and the thing is too like you know with I feel really bad for a lot of Mennonites, and especially like the ones that are grown up in the same cultures that that we were is is there's not there's not really a, a good base on teaching them what 
how to how to live a marriage other than you know you'll get baptized and then you'll be yeah. fine that way. Then you, go to, you go to church and then you know you get married and, and the rest. But is if you've got history. if you got yeah. uh, sexual problems, uh, uh, conversation problems, like you, you oh, know, yeah. there's nobody to talk to. Nobody just says anything. Go figure it out. out. There's no there's no mention of pornography. That was also another yeah. hindrance, like crazy in my life was was that because that obviously causes confrontation Constantly between dissatisfaction yeah, between the husband and the mm-hmm. wife, right? And you know especially. Now I can see it from her point of view. There's there's a lot of you know insecurity there, right? And women do tend to you know be a little bit more insecure, you know. And that's where we play you know our our dominance role is we we make sure that they're secure. That yeah. Way. But if you're if you don't have that information, what do you do with it? You know. And I thought, well, I'm married. I can do whatever I want. I don't have mom and dad anymore, so I'm just kind of well, living for myself. That's a bad recipe, man. It is a bad recipe. It's sure. my my life actually shows, you know, how that recipe will unfold, mm-hmm. you know, until, you know, you wake yeah. up and you, you get Jesus. So you, you're out of the home, you get bailed out of jail, and then you take your first shot of meth. Yeah. Is it, is it a needle? No, it, well, you can, but I, I smoked it. Okay. I, never, I never got into the needle thing, thank God for that. Because um, that I've heard is also one of those things where you just can't. You, you can't need it in your blood, blood, right? You can't remove yourself from it. Um, so I, I smoked it, and... Right the next day, I felt like crap. I didn't feel good at all, and so. But everyone who I was hanging out with, they were still on it. They were still going, and so it was introduced to me right away in the morning. And I was actually was working with John, and so he brought it with us to work, and so he was on it. And I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. By that evening, I was craving it so badly that I had to have it. Really? And it, I just from smoking it one evening. Yeah, just one evening. <laughs> I think I had maybe two two puffs. That's all I had. For real? Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was a really bad coming off, but before the coming off was done, you needed it again. Hmm. And not that you needed it, but you wanted it. It wasn't. And, and that one was much different than cocaine, and in, in the way that it affected you as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it totally. It, cocaine will grab your attention and your focus for that time, and then if you get past the, the coming off, then then you're okay. Then you're almost like back to sober. You know, where you can, you know, make another rational decision if you like or if you choose mm-hmm. to. And that gives you that chance to get off of it, and especially with the way it feels, it's easier to get off. Mind you, it's not easy to get off, but uh, meth, it, it grabs you immediately, 24 hours immediately. a day, seven days a week. And it makes you feel relaxed when you're high? Um, or? No, not really. It's actually very jittery and very, very outgoing. Oh, like, really? You know, like someone on meth would, you know, take apart this trailer and put it back together and take it apart put it back together and then go over there and do something go over there and do something go over there and do super something super productive yeah even if it's nonsense yeah it doesn't well usually it's nonsense okay yeah you think it's really good but everyone else sees it as nonsense I see you know, which is also another battle right and that's yeah. where your life ended up going right yeah so this was how many years ago uh that I started yeah that would have been about nine, actually 11 years ago 11 now. years ago yeah so it would be even longer yet yeah. so then it was this constant thing so for the next two and a half years or was that not the time yet where you left home completely where you couldn't see your kids well that's when I left home and that's when I started it yeah and I ended up um, not getting back together with my wife for about three years and then I was living with my brother Frank at the time and so then she had you know decided it was gonna be time for us to get back together and so I was, it was actually I was on the basis that I wasn't doing any drugs anymore. Right. And I, my history is the same. I lied. Right. And so I, I said I wasn't, and I wasn't going to. And, and I had actually spent a month in jail a little bit before that, so I had quit during that time. And then, but that only lasted about two weeks, maybe, and then I was back into it. But I just didn't tell anybody. And so it was another, you know, long. So you could kind of hide it from some people, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of had a maintenance on it. You know, mind you, you can't really maintain it that well. But Somebody who knew you really well, like after yeah. a while, probably your wife or your yeah, brothers, they knew. would know. Yeah, my wife knew. Yeah, but then it was almost to, to the point where it was almost too late for her to do much about it because we were already living together again, mm-hmm. spending time with the kids, and I've always had a really good relationship with my kids. It was something I kind of kept aside from them. So I still, you know, tried to do as good as I could as a dad, 
but our marriage was was really not good at all because she knew the truth and I knew the truth and wow. just we weren't you know. and then were you still drinking a lot during that time no actually that was a during the time we were separated I quit drinking and you'd never yeah. gone back to alcohol never gone back to alcohol yeah and I was a full-blown alcoholic I'd say for about 12 years yeah yeah and before that I was actually a, an alcoholic for about seven years and I had a, a spot in between where I quit for like four years I see yeah so you've been on substances of some sort constantly since Almost the time you were like right, 16, yeah. 18 years old. Yeah, yeah it's a really rough, really rough go. It's a really see. rough way to go. Because obviously there's always opinions that go along with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not socially acceptable except for certain crowds. And so then, you know, it's hard to maintain a life where you still work and you still do all those things. But, you know, so you always got these double-sided, kind of like what the Bible talks about, the double double life, right? Yeah. And so there's, you know, the good part, you know, you put on a show and then there's the bad part where you indulge and you enjoy yourself the way, you, you know, you feel open and free to do, you know, feeding your addiction and then you got to go back and man, it's hard man. to juggle that. That is uh, hard to let myself into to try to imagine. Like I can, I can identify with certain tiny aspects of it, but to, obviously once you're on meth, it's totally different. Like it just oh, yeah. consumes your life. Yeah. So you did go down that crazy rabbit trail where you started doing like uh, picking up garbage beside the yeah. or jumping through dumpsters even yeah. like yeah, I, it's I, probably I, something that you feel I, a little I, bit ashamed of now yeah, but it's very like, much it, that's so, what yeah. it led you to do right yeah well I I did do I did do dumpster diving for quite a few years and you know there's some highs and some lows there some, the lows are really, really bad, but I mean, the highs are, you know, you'll find something worth a couple hundred dollars, you'll sell it and you feel good about yourself, but then that just drives the next time and you just... You're always hoping, almost like playing the lottery, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to win is, next, next like time, I'll lottery, find something yeah. really valuable. Yeah. And the thing is, it's actually better than the lottery because you win more often than the lottery. Right. It which keeps actually, going, which right. makes it worse because then you, you know, and you're like, well, if I stay home today, then... You know, I don't really, I won't gain much. But if I go out and I dumpster dive, well, I could gain this and I could gain that. And and sometimes it was, you know, what it seemed to be worth it, you know. But then other times it just wasn't. It's just but ultimately, that's, that's, that, that. I mean, I would, I would do this in a sense. In a sense, let's say I was driving down the road and I see somebody's got something valuable out the road and they're just throwing it away. Obviously, I'd go grab yeah. it. So yeah. it's kind of the same idea. Except but you're going through somebody's trash, yeah. right? And the thing is, too, with with that kind of a situation, you're not. You're not making a lifestyle out of it. When you're on meth, yeah. And when you're dumpster diving, you're it making became, a, it, it's a lifestyle. It's, right. It's it's not only the meth is addictive, but the, the the digging is also addictive, and you know the the hoarding comes along with it. Yeah, your yard a, started to pile up with stuff. Amount, it's a huge, and then it comes to you know to the point of overwhelming. But you can't really reverse it because you still want to always go get the next thing. Interesting. And it just it builds and it builds and it builds and it's 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 basically a really it's Satan's way of you know dividing and conquering, right? right? Well, sometimes I look at someone like yourself, and I, I look at the bad habits that you started and the crazy lifestyle that you went down, and it seems very obviously bad and damaging. Mm-hmm. But some of the exact habits that you had, I see played out on a much smaller scale. Sometimes in my own life or in other people's lives that I know, they they keep doing the same stupid yeah. things yeah. over and thinking that next time it's gonna be better, next time it's gonna be better, next time. You know, it's hard. Not somebody to. could do it with. With um, binge watching TV, yeah. Oh, this show is going to be awesome, and you watch the next season, the next season, the next season. You're like spending all this time and hours looking for that next big high, right? Like yeah. it just gives you this dopamine rush. It and does. You're like yeah. next one's going to be even better. Yeah. And soon your whole life is consumed with something completely useless. Yeah. And naturally we do that because we we naturally. But those are acceptable, yeah. and what you were doing was kind of socially well, unacceptable. Yeah, it's absolutely un- unacceptable. Like I look at, you know, I look at. Um, my home now, like when I drive in the driveway, it looks the same every day, which is good. Uh, you know, there's a bike in front of the garage, and you know, there's a fishing pole and maybe some boots. Yeah. But that's it. There's you know, no clutter everywhere. Before, I would have to maneuver my way through the doorway, and you know, because it just got to be overwhelming over everywhere. And then, you know, when it, there wasn't enough room there, instead of getting rid of a bunch of stuff, I'd pile more and pile more and pile mm-hmm. more, and it just becomes a big mess. And then you feel so overwhelmed, so then you go get, you know, you get yourself abused by a substance to kind of, you know, get rid of that, that part of you that you don't want to see. Yeah. And you get to but it drives to you to more of the same. The enjoyment of it. And then, so it's something that, like, kind of like the sin, you don't really want to face it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you're better off to go 
around the back door and just do some other things that distract you from it instead of going back into that, you know, facing the sin head on. I can identify with that. that. There's times when I have something I know I need to deal with, but instead I'll go around doing other things yeah. instead of dealing with that. Well, but the same. yours just became a bigger yeah. picture well, of it. It's, a, it's the same concept, except when you're driven by meth, it excels everything. Yeah. It excels the speed of your thoughts and, and everything, and not your good thoughts, but all just driven your bad thoughts. Hmm. I mean, there is some, you know, you still have a heart, and you still have somewhat of a, uh, a common Conscience. sense. Some people do, I guess. It depends Guilt on... Guilt and shame or not? Yes. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, but you can hide it. You can you can you can cover it up. There's um, conscience and all that stuff still exists. Maybe not, and it's kind of it's for certain things. It's there, but not for all things. Right. You know, like there's certain things I could do. I could, you know, it wouldn't. I wouldn't bat an eye. And then other things I'd feel really horrible about. I see. Now looking back, I feel horrible about all, all of them. them. Yeah, horrible, all yeah. of them. Like you know, some of the things I did was like. Can I just do that? It was just, I would forget about it because I didn't want to face it. I didn't want, like, you know, going back and, and apologizing or saying something like that or, or admitting you're wrong. I mean, that doesn't really work that well when it comes yeah. to addiction. <clears throat> and so it's the same same concept as a regular person faces, except it's expelled uh, like steroids. Yeah, it's like steroids of all the bad decisions you could make. And then there's a lot of... Uh, conscience is still there, but a lot of your... Um, what's the word... Um, Inhibitions. They're they're just you know you have so little care about certain things mm. and it just it's insane. I, for one, uh, actually, I was gonna mention that where you said you you know drive by somewhere and somebody's throwing something valuable, you'll take it. I I was on the way to work one day and I saw a big box and it was for free, so I grabbed it. I didn't even know what it was, so I took it home. It turned out to be a brand new air purifier. It was like eighteen hundred bucks. I am selling it for like twelve hundred dollars. That was an awesome day. That was one of those situations where anybody could have done that and it would have been totally acceptable. Yeah. Everything is just fine. Normal, yeah. but that's not at all where it stayed. Like if I could have just done that, I would have been fine. I would, you know. But that obviously doesn't happen every day. Yeah. You know. So, but. But you always think maybe what if, what if, yeah. what if, right? Yeah. So that and even today, it's a little bit hard sometimes to drive by, you know, a store that I know is you know known to be throwing good things out. And I see. It's still a little tough. But I just, I think about it now as in like, first off, my wife, my children, and what kind of example I want to set for them, and what's that going to do for my future, you know, and it's not, it doesn't have the same, it does have an appeal still, but it doesn't have the same appeal without the drugs. I see. The drugs give it that appeal. So you, now you can kind of dampen that down a little bit. Yeah. It's not like yeah. on a hyperdrive, right? Yeah, I can, I can drive by and I'm fine. Hmm. Like, I'll think about it a little bit, but as opposed to before, it's like, I would get angry if I... I mean, there are people that make a good business uh, taking other people's junk and fixing it up and yeah. selling it so that that is an option when yeah. you were doing that full time when you were doing that all the time was it kind of your job did you quit working um, even? yeah I did actually I stopped working for about two three years I and just, did that sustain you at all or was um, it just enough to feed your addiction it, well my wife was working at the time so that that helped you know where if she wouldn't have been working there wouldn't have been enough mm -hmm. but I did make a good amount of money it wasn't any by a, a good amount by any means, like drastically or anything. Like we we did make it, but we didn't excel very mm -hmm. much. Like you know, we had those times where you know you'd, you'd get a, a good thing or whatever, and you you do pretty well for a little bit, but he always had to catch up, and so it was it was enough to kind of get by. Like we didn't starve or we didn't die, wow. but it wasn't any kind of a living right. at all, and not something that you'd be really proud of in a sense. Right? No, that's the thing is like, and it was it actually worked out well because you know at the time in my lifestyle. We didn't have a lot of visitors, and thank God for that, because every time somebody came over, even my parents, for instance, I would, you know, I would hope that they would close their eyes on the left side, you know, like, don't look at all that stuff over there, yeah. you know, you're just here for us, right, kind of thing, but that wasn't the case. And then you nobody know. wants to come, right, yeah. they don't want to feel weird. And then, in that sense, you know, even though there's a bit of sadness because of it, but it was actually worked out well, you know, because I didn't want everybody to know everything, you know, it's kind of like, you know, my bubble kind of thing. Yeah. And so I would have... Like when people did come over, we had family come over and stuff. It was awkward. It was almost annoying. Like, you know, why can't I come over to your house instead? You know? And then your wife was, is living in this. Oh, she was. And she's a bit of a neat freak. She's a bit of a clean one. Must and, have tormented oh, her. Oh, I feel so bad for her sometimes. Like, And it did torment her. And she made it very well known. But I just didn't. And your trap? Didn't really. There wasn't enough to do anything about it. You yeah. know, and that. And. The times that I did try to quit, did try to quit either dumpster diving or drugs, 
it just wasn't possible. Yeah. It was like literally not possible. I would go a couple days and I would be in torment of my body, my mind, my ambition, everything. Like when you get yeah, off of meth. It kind of kept you almost sane in your normal life. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. Like when you get off of meth, there's about a, a week to two weeks of, of a period where you've never felt so low. You've never been so tired. Like you could literally sleep six days away, no problem. Hmm. You know, you could eat, go to the bathroom, and that's it. And then you're super hungry. But there's there's that, and so you've got to get away from it for that period of, of feeling really, really bad to be able to get away from it. And then that's just where the starting is. But then in everyone, in most regular cases, there's about a four-year period where you'll still crave it every single day. Mm-hmm. It's a battle. every And for the most part, I never thought I'd get off of it. Never. I was hoping you just kind of concluded already this was the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah, because I, I saw literally no way out. And I know I talked to Tony quite a bit. I've known him for seven or eight years now too, mm-hmm. right? And he would he would sometimes get really hopeful that you were coming off, that you had come, gone back to jail again, I think, yeah. another time or two. Quite a few times, actually. And there was times where he was like, he would try to help you out, maybe help pitch in, I forget now, to bail you out or something along those lines. Yeah. And thinking that maybe this time something will change, and then he felt completely heartbroken you know when you would go right back to it but you were again you were trapped yeah you, I was addicted I couldn't yeah. couldn't really do it on my own I couldn't do anything yeah. about it and the times that I was in jail I mean that was the longest times I was sober because right because yeah. you had no choice yeah there you couldn't get it but otherwise yeah there was just no hope for me that way and I think that's that's also another humongous reason why I appreciate the gospel why I appreciate what it did because in a sense, like, I thought I was on a death trap. I was, there was just no way out for mm-hmm. me. Like, my best bet was to die, pretty much. Like, that was, that was my way out. That was what I was going to be. The only way I could see getting off of it, getting out of it. I was in, um, I went to Josh House in, in BC, and within the first week, I stopped craving. Stopped craving? Stopped craving, yeah. And, I mean, you weren't uh, regenerated or anything like that at that point? I, w- I was actually ju- just a few days okay. after I got regenerated. I completely stopped craving. I, before we get to that, I wanted to just quickly, I know the last month or two before you went to Joshua House is when we kind of became a little bit more acquainted with you guys. You started yeah. showing up to church services sometimes, and yeah. John and Susan Dyke started talking to you guys and, yeah, and trying to help you out, yeah. you know, moving you from one house to the other and all that. And yeah. there was, like, this tremendous battle to try to get you to go. You would be willing to go, but then you would resist with yeah. all your might, right? Yeah. Like, and it I was, was back and yeah. forth. Back I wanted forth. to go, but I didn't want to go now. And I don't want to go next week either or the week after. All right. But I know I want to go. I'll do it when I want to yeah. do it. And the timing never came. And, and the things, it was well, quite hectic because we were moving and because I had so much stuff. Like, I had so much yeah. stuff. Yeah, cows like, even. Yeah, and I still actually have one cow left. Yeah, which that's something I'm proud of. I, I really enjoyed that aspect of life. That was, that was fun. And uh, it still is fun to have yeah. that, but that's a that's an acceptable thing. But if you kept pushing it off and pushing it off like you were doing, eventually you would just never get there, right? Yeah, because you wouldn't would. find the motivation in your own no. heart. So what, what like what would you recommend to somebody like that? You almost were kind of coerced or pushed into it at the end. Yeah. Right? Well, the thing is, in the end, and it bothered me like crazy at the time, but I see it as it was. May God, have God, God working his, 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 his magic and his providence and saying, okay, John, you know, you've got to die now. This is it. You've had enough. This is, this is where you've got to go and you've got to change. Um, so but George, was, Tony, John, all yeah. kind of helping you. They, while well, they were pushing it, and, but the, the thing is, my wife was not accepting of it, but she hadn't, you know, finalized it yet, but. I had fell asleep behind the high school. I was going to do some dumpster diving, and the police came, and they woke me up, and I never got in, like, big trouble, but then they brought it to her attention, and then she said that was it. That was the final straw for her. If I wasn't going to go, I was going to lose my family again, mm-hmm. and that devastated me. I couldn't imagine the thought of ever not being with my children ever again. But you could feel that it was a reality. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. That she could was be serious it. on it, and she's... She's known to be that kind of a woman that, you know, when she says something, she she really sticks to it mm-hmm. way too much, <laughs> but which is a good thing. And so that was, I was faced with the decision of, you know, continuing the drug life and, and continuing my addiction and never seeing my family again. And I knew she was going to make it happen. She had that strength and that ambition to do that or I was going to go get clean. And then Tony and George, your brother-in-law and your brother, both bought tickets and flew yeah. out to BC with you, yeah. almost kind of dragging you out there. Yeah, they, well, they, yeah, they were afraid that maybe you would take you know, take off running somewhere. And yeah. I probably would have. I probably would have. And we even got to BC, and, and I, 
I, I had brought some stuff with me, and I, I knew that this was going to be one of my last times ever. So I, I went for a walk, and I, I did some drugs. And even then, they were like, you know, they were scared like crazy. They thought I'd left. And I hadn't planned on, like, taking off, taking off, but I I had left. You were frustrated. Yeah, yeah I wanted, because since they came pick me up, I was with them the whole time. And as an addict, that's a really long time. You're yeah. on a flight for four hours, that's that's a really, really long like, time. You needed it every few hours? Yeah. Yeah, I would say on, like, a regular hour replenishing. And it was always just smoking? Yep. Wow. Yeah. And if you went, like, say, three hours, you did really well. You did very well. But that, you know, normally didn't happen. Why bother? Yeah. If you have it, just yeah. go for it. So then you get the Joshua house, and they just drop you off, and you're alone in this world far, far across the country. Yeah, that was, that was kind of a... Well, because originally I thought that, you know, we're going to get there. It's going to be, like, it's going to take a couple hours, the whole intake and everything else. And basically, they showed up the driveway, We and I got out. And I didn't know what the process was going to be like. So right away you go into a, a changing room and you change and you change into their clothes and then they they treat your clothing for bed bugs and stuff so they, they heat it and then they search you and they search your Make apartment. sure there's nothing on Yeah, there. which that was kind of a, a crappy thing at the time because I had drugs with me so I thought, well, at least I've got a bit of a, a you know, stash, yeah. yeah, a little bit of a time where I can kind of wean off of it and it was like, nope, that's it. Like, Cold you know, turn. you walk in the door and that was the last time you, you're going to be able to and there's nothing available there at all. And so that's a really good thing. And then um, they take away your cell phone, which is a, another huge blessing. It doesn't seem like it at the time. I was going like, to say, the, what was the like, feeling like then? Was it dread? Was it fear? Was it loneliness? Or well, like, it, was, it was complete loneliness and chaos at the same time. And fearing what you know you're going to go into withdrawal. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Like it was, it was just a matter of time. Like I was, you know, already from sobering up so much on the trip, I was already feeling that down. Mm -hmm. And then. I got a little bit of an up at the at the hotel, but then the next day they wouldn't let me out of the car. They wouldn't let me out of their sight, which is, you know, hindsight it's a blessing because I I know what I would have done right away. Wow! And so it was, you know, now here you are. You don't even have your own clothes. You're in a place that you have no idea. You're sleeping in a bunk bed. Don't with, know with another, Yeah, you don't know. If, actually, I knew. Uh, I know. I knew Pete Gunther's brother Henry. Okay. And so I got to know him there. They were they're pretty much the same. So that was the only kind of but he wasn't even in, in our cabin or anything. So I only got Man. to know him later on. It was like where God had shown you shown me that you literally don't have anything. Like all of my stuff that I clinged on to was all at home. My wife and my kids were at home. Any kind of family I couldn't have phone calls for the first two weeks brother and brother-in-law just yep. dropped you off oh, as soon as I went in the door they were gone and I went outside I came back outside after the, their whole admittance and everything else and they're just gone this is it and I was I was so devastated and angry like really really angry because that you just felt I felt so very betrayed mm -hmm. I felt like okay now they dropped me off at the, the ends of the earth and that's it for no me no way to go home. and they could care less if I come back and it was just like you know that feeling of, of having nothing, being stripped of everything. There's pride, dignity, all that stuff was long out the window. And now the very basics that I was still holding on to, they were gone yet too. Hmm. And I knew that there was just, at least for a time, it's kind of like when you walk into jail. When you walk into jail, you you know, when you hear that, you know, cling, it's like, okay, this is going to be a long time. Hmm. You know, that's the only thing you really know is that it's going to be a long time. You know, whether it's, you know, two days or six months, or it, it regardless, it, it feels like way too long. And so that's what I was kind of like, and that was that emotion that I was going through actually helped me to surrender, to finally come to kind to, of brought you to the end of your rope. Yeah, because I mean I had lost literally everything, and I, you know, I'd always been trying to, you know, show God how I wanted to do it. You know, like you know, if if you join my team, you know, the, we'll do yeah. it this way. You know, I'll, I'll do the good things here, but I was still going to do a couple of bad things, and you know, that sort of thing. So I was trying to, wow. you know, and then. That was like okay. I, I always try to like, think your way out of mm -hmm. out of things, right? Yeah, and I, I was and you can use relatively talk your pretty way. good at it. Yeah. I mean, you're 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 quite uh, capable at speaking, obviously, yeah. right? So yeah, you could very easily manipulate yeah. and speak. I always had a kind of a. I always think I should have been in sales a little bit. Yeah, you know, because I've been in sales a couple of times. I've always done not bad. So, but but you couldn't you couldn't sell couldn't, God. That, I could not sell myself out of that one. It was just the way it is. There you were. You know, and. It was it was tough because I mean you walk in there and it, it's everyone else they, the first cabin is Genesis 
And that's when, you know, God wasn't the proudest of man, right? And they named it that way for for reason. But you're in there with a bunch of other people going through withdrawals. Same, and else. same place. So it's, it's a tough, tough go that way. You're not in full restrictions like jail, but it's it might as well be the same thing. It's 40 something kilometer hour walk or 40 kilometer walk to town and there was nobody gonna you know take you or whatever so mm. if you wanted to leave you could you know you just had to go out the front gate and you know let everybody know you're leaving and then take a you know nine hour walk up the road and you were back to civilization Sheesh. and so you know so it felt like prison kind of yeah there was just no thing. so you said six days into this something happened were they yeah. was were they sharing with you was there a good hope well, given by them i i don't Yes, it was, but not not, not that what I really not, affected you. No, I didn't understand it that way. I just understood this is their practice. This is what they do. Um, there's there's Bible study every morning. You do get a grace period where you know you can sleep and you don't have to participate because you're because tired. you're coming off and all that stuff. But um, so there was that, and I was just like looking at it very annoyingly, like you know, really, like you know, the last thing I want is you know this kind of hope. Give me some real hope, something like like a plane ticket or something. Yeah. Like that's the kind of hope I was looking for. And so that was my first first few days there. It was just not fun. Miserable. Everything was was crap, and all the people were just like you know, people I didn't know to be at, you know I couldn't be addicts with them, but yet they're addicts. So it's a totally you know and they're all miserable too. Yeah, probably coming thing, out yeah. of there. Everybody's freaking out. And, you know, the food is is not the greatest, but you know that kind of sucks a little bit too. And yeah, we weren't allowed to have cups. You no, know, you know you had to get. There's all these permissions and stuff that you, you know I'm used to waking up in the morning and getting my coffee and stuff, and there was no coffee. Oh man! So it was it was rough. Come off coffee yeah. as well. Oh yeah, it was rough. <laughs> like the whole time I was out there, not a t well, I had one Tim Hortons coffee the whole time I was out oh, there. I see. And so that was that was a t tough one, and um, yeah, it was it was really really tough for the first little bit. But tell us about the change. Well, I was um, really, really miserable. It brought me a lot to the same emotions I was feeling when I was in jail. Really hopeless, really, you know, desperate, I guess. And so the one night I, I couldn't fall asleep, but I was exhausted. And I, I just, I was tossing and turning and tossing and turning. And it just, all of a sudden I started talking to God and I, I just told him I gave up. Audibly? Yep. I, it was just me, I, I had my own room by myself at the time. And so I give up. Like whatever you want from me, I don't get it. Like I don't know what you want from me. I don't know this what you think miserable. you're gonna do. But whatever this is, it's not good. It's not working for me. And so whatever you have going on, whatever you want from me, just do it. Because I was, I was like angry in the sense because you know here I was trying hard all my life to get things to go the way I wanted to, and what, sometimes they did a little bit. But then you know overall my my whole life was on a you know pretty steady down. It was almost like dumpster diving. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like constantly hoping oh. for the next high, but it's just not happening. Not yeah. happening. You get a bit of a relief, and then it goes back to garbage again. So you gave up. You said, "God, I give up." Yeah. Giving up, trying to make a way, trying to figure this out, trying to think it through. Well, for me, it was more. I gave up fighting with him, okay. fighting against him. That you know, I was going to surrender fully. You know, whatever you want. Because you you were fairly familiar with the gospel even before. Yeah. Right, because yeah. remember John and, and a few others talking to you, are like, he seems to know the right understanding, mm -hmm. like he has a grasp of the gospel, yeah. but it never really took heart. No, I was introduced to the gospel when I was 17, when my brother Frank got baptized, yeah. and I spent a lot of time in, in going to the Hope Center, and I really enjoyed it, I really, like, I think if I would have, you know, really stuck it out then, I, I could have had a way different life. But I didn't. I just, you yeah. know, I was too self-involved. I was. So now, when you were surrendering your life, saying, "God, I give up," you were just letting Him have control. Yeah. And I didn't even quite know what I was doing. I don't think. Um, so I was just kind of really angry, and I wanted to, you know, yell at somebody or complain to somebody or you know get somebody's sympathy. And I had nobody to talk to except for God. Yeah. And I ended up, you know, surrendering. And what He did, like. It was just, it was amazing. All of a sudden, the next morning, I woke up and I had a, like, I had a thirst for the Bible. I sat down for the Bible study in the morning, and and I actually understood a little bit of it. And I'm like, that, that's it's weird because I've tried to read the Bible before, but it never made any sense at all. Mm -hmm. Like you know, all these verses and stuff are just like, well, that's just blah blah blah, and that's blah blah blah. But never anything, nothing ever stuck. Remember like, even John three sixteen. No, I don't know. Okay. But even John three sixteen, like I knew that verse. You know, you all can my read life. the word. Yeah. yeah. 
but it never it never took hold. Yeah. It never it never really meant That's anything. That's interesting. The veil was suddenly removed, yeah. and now all of a sudden, the words that you knew from childhood mean something. Yeah. And then you know they I were went through that. offering opinions and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, well, that one doesn't make sense to me. And I would start to share, it, and then it just it just came to that. I was actually I was I had a, the right train of thought anyway. I wasn't mm -hmm. by all by any means a professional, but I could I could discern what was right and what was wrong. And obviously, not everyone has you know a good understanding of the gospel. Some yep. are still playing that part, and some are not. And I could discern it, and I, I found that so very interesting that I could actually I'm figure out like, what's going on. I can understand. And I didn't even know that that was what it was. That it, it was something that Jesus did. That it was just these like, things are spiritually discerned, right? Yeah, it wasn't a fluke. Was, yeah, you know, I, no man can understand the things of God save the Spirit of God. Exactly. So if the Spirit of God is now in you suddenly, then all of a sudden the things that He has said they will jive, right? Mm -hmm. Where your spirit will identify with the truth in the Scriptures, and suddenly it's like. Ah, this is life. Yeah. Give me some more of this. And right? actually, that's a, it's a really cool thing to see. Like, as a dad, it's got to be one of the most. If you, if you can have any kind of pride as a dad, it, for me, it just it just excels above all else when you can when you can watch your children discern. Like, um, Eric was listening to a, a sermon the other day, and it was um, I forget exactly what it was. But he's like, Dad, what do you think of that? Does that that makes sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. It was, it was totally off. It was something to do with the rapture, and it was totally off. And just to watch him like be able to discern it himself, he's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. There's no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. Yeah. Says, because says it's wrong. Apostle John, yeah. Yeah. It's totally wrong. So we're going to, I mean, we're, it's pretty, pretty easy to talk to you. We're yeah. kind of coming up on an hour. I have that energy. Uh, <laughs> my wife is always standing outside. Let's go, let's, let's go, go. Let's go. Yeah. But anyway, we got like five or ten minutes left maybe, but you, uh, you <laughs> surrendered your life Something changed. The Bible became interesting. You spent another couple months there after. Yeah, that. yeah. And there was probably a mixture of excitement and joy that you were free, but torment that you're not with your family. Yeah, it was, well, because I was so excited to go back home. Because my my goal of going out there was to get it done, get it over with, and go home. And the addiction was gone now. Yeah. And so I, I thought to myself, well, I'm free, right? Yeah. And so I've done what I came to do. Now let me get back to doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Now I've got the mindset of, of Christ, and so now I can lead my family in the proper way, so now let me get back to my family. Mm -hmm. So I called my wife first after the three weeks or so, and it felt like two months already. Like I, I, I sure. did the math, and I'm like, there's enough Saturdays I get. It should match pretty close, and I'm, I'm usually pretty good at math. And No, well, it's only been three weeks. I'm like, there's no way. I've literally I mean, been here forever. for six Wednesdays. Like, come on, it's got to be, like, it's got to be. And so she wasn't having it, and she wasn't, you know, ready to let me go, come home yet. She's still very much doubt, obviously, from all the torment and everything else. The agreement before. was at least three months, yeah. right? Yeah, which I kind of forgot, you know, while I was there. It wasn't really focused on paying attention to what they were saying, you know, what I agreed to and any of that kind of stuff. So that was a bit of a, that was another hard thing to do. Yeah, because then they feel like you were you were just trying to scam them. Again, yeah, I was right? trying to rush it, and I was trying to rush it. I didn't want to be out there any longer than I had to, and I was always under the whim that I, or under the idea that I might be able to get to go home early. So that's kind of where I was pushing for. You know, I wasn't. When I did a call to go home, I wasn't calling home because I just wanted to escape. I wanted to call home because I was ready to go home. Mm -hmm. and, so you uh, could feel that you were free. Oh, yeah. You weren't going back to that yeah. stuff. Actually, when, uh, when I called my wife, I had a dream the night before. And uh, I had a dream that, you know, I was at home and my kids and everything were, were at my, my parents and were playing in the field and everything else. And so they asked if I would come home. And I said, yeah, as soon as you guys want me to come home, I'll come home. And they're like, well, we want you to come home. And so I went outside and after I woke up and I went outside and so I started talking to God, like, if this is a real thing, you know, if it's not just me manifesting this, you know, a sign would be great. And I look up in the sky, there's a star, like a single star right in front of a like, great where Ontario would be, like directly above it. So, okay, that's something I said, you know, let's go home. And then I, I prayed again and I went inside and I started reading the Bible and I, where I, I started where I left off the night before when I went to bed. And within the first paragraph, it's where um, Jesus is going to go to get crucified, but he's not going yet. And it says, I'm not ready yet, but in two days I will go. Mm -hmm. and it was a Friday, so I'm like, okay, well, then I'll wait Saturday and Sunday. It was like, everything was automatic. Like, this is, and I, you know, maybe a lot of it was me. Trying to I'm, piece yeah, something together yeah, to make it work. But it just seemed like it was all working, and then it wasn't happening. And then I called again later on. I called George a little while later, like a week later. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to go, and, and you guys can just buy me the tickets, and because I didn't have any money or anything. And that wasn't happening either. He was going to call 
John and Tony. And the thing with them that bothered me a lot was like if I called John, John would call say, Okay, I'll talk to George and Tony and then but it would just never happen. Like it would never like and it, whenever if I would convince one of them, then the other two would be like, no. And then it was mm-hmm. just kind of a back and forth. And it was like, probably necessary to yeah. kind of make sure that they didn't frustra- fall prey yeah, to Yeah, your... frustrating like crazy because I'm like, okay, well, I can't repeat these things because I, I won't, you know, like I've, now that I've got it, like let me just, you know, get the completion, right? Mm-hmm. I want the success that I got from the conversation. I want that to carry through. But they weren't there, and obviously there's a difference in opinion. So there was nothing at Joshua House that really excited you to stay there. There was nothing that um, you were... Not more than my family at home. Yeah, I've I've always really really loved my kids, and I really enjoyed my wife, especially then. I was um, I was excited to see her. I right. Was really, I really missed her, and so I didn't want to stay any longer. Hindsight now, though, I wish I could go back. Yeah. Because the time that I was there, it was so secluded. I I found myself bored a lot. So I took and I just read the Bible and I read the Bible and I read the Bible and I read the Bible. And yep. And then two with the other, as you go on and you, everybody moves up in their faith and, and gets stronger in their faith, different trials come up and you kind of figure things out and you're, you're just almost like a Bible college almost, mm-hmm. you know. And we had, you know, every Wednesday we had church and every Sunday we had church. Every night we had a Bible study of some sort. And then we had every day we had prayer for two hours in the morning. Then we had Bible study after that. Then wow. there was a video after that. Like Almost like a was, monastery. You think of these monks, non-stop. they go off and they separate themselves from the world completely. They yeah. wear plain clothes and they just study and pray and yeah. read. And well, that, yeah, that was kind of like that. Like, I had four but, sets of clothes now. And then. Jesus does warn about uh, the cares of this world and the foolishness of riches, yeah. how it's very deceptive, right? Because we is. get into this world now and we're constantly distracted by these things yeah. and we're thinking about the next thing and we're so consumed with all the stuff that we very rarely have time to stop and think of what God has done and who He is and pray and read. And yeah, absolutely. Like, it, I think now, I mean, as my wife has, you know, told me, like, stop sometimes, you know, like, you know, you read too much. You get into the Word too much. You just, that's where all your time goes. And I'm so used to it because of the time I spent Joshua. So that's all I could do. That's all I wanted to do. So I developed that habit and I, I have a real thirst for it. And now I'm confronted with real life things, right? Where I still have to work, I still have to be a husband, still yeah. have to be a dad, and, I, and still I, study this. I have this 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 drive where you know I want to just kind of like push it a little bit, and then I want to go here first, and then I want to you know yeah. but I, I can't do that. Yeah. So now for me, like you know, I get feel privileged when my wife wants to drive. Yeah, I bring the Bible and I can read for an hour. I can read for half an hour, stuff like that. And it's just, it's kind of like, well, I have. Why, yeah, see, why when do I, I have to drive? When I first got saved, the first uh, couple years, I spent in a semi truck. As a passenger, not driving, oh, that'd be I perfect. could sit there and just read and that'd read and read I, and listen to sermons for hours on end. So yeah, and it's never enough, really. No, exactly. You know. So what's uh, what's the future now? Obviously, you and your wife are learning to get along now again. You're raising your boys. You know, they've made some professions and things mm-hmm. like that. Like wh- everything's kind of opened up to you now, right? Yeah. Like you, you could go in so many different directions. Now I'm just waiting for the after. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Um, not, I am waiting for it and I'm excited for it, but... Uh, There's so much to do here yeah, right now. there is so much. Um, I don't know, for me, it's uh, kind of when I came back from BC, there was, you know, the whole work thing, and now I'm going to have to work and stuff like that. And I just kind of, I, I, I prayed about it, and I was in no rush to get it started, but it was, it, after our, our camp at Tamagami, it just kind of, okay, now is the time to, to start working. And mm-hmm. so, it was, I started praying about it, and I went to, uh, I went to uh, Remtech, and I was thinking about working there, and that ended up becoming just another avenue of uh, God to show me what He wanted me to do, and that ended up leading to my boss now, Will Clausen, and I love working for him. He's an awesome boss. He's super generous. He's very kind. He doesn't get mad. He, you know, he understands yeah. flaws and stuff, and he's a believer as well. Nice. So I'm just kind of letting God lead the way. There you go. You know, whatever whatever He wants me to do, I'm more than happy to do it, and. He doesn't leave me bored very much. Mm-hmm. Like if I have a, a stance where I'm, you know, kind of feeling not spiritually high anymore, mm-hmm. it doesn't take very long. And he, he'll do something, 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 and it, and it'll be a conversation, or it'll be somebody else I'm, I'm talking with or helping, or something like that. Like I've had a couple, you know, people reach out, and I've been able to encourage them. So that that's a just an awesome feeling altogether. Yeah. 
and then we do our, our weekly Bible studies, and then we do our weekly prayer meetings, and Sunday church. Life just stays full. And yeah. Busy. One last question. I know we could go another full hour easily talking about your your life now and temptations or whatever, but for me, one of the most important things is, do you know when you first really saw Jesus, recognized his work on the cross, saw that it was for you? April 7th, yeah. Yeah? April 7th, yeah. Yeah, was, at Joshua uh, at Joshua was, yeah. That night when you surrendered? Uh, it was a little bit after that. Okay. A little bit after that. We had a, there was a, a younger guy, he was, um, <clears throat> he was having some, some issues with, he had given his, his soul to the devil, so to speak, and he was really wrestling with that, and so there was, um, I think there was a five of us. We, we saw the need for, for prayer for him because he was just struggling and he was going against the grain of everything that Josh Rose had to offer, but he needed it really bad. He was only 18 years old and he was going, it was either that or he was going to go to, to a, a 10 year prison thing because he wow. shot and killed somebody and stuff like that. So he needed the gospel really bad. And so there was a bunch of us, we got together and we prayed and we prayed really good and really hard and it was, it was moved by the Holy Spirit. It was just, it was such an awesome prayer moment between all of us and, and the way none of us were would able to would be able to speak that way normally but we we all took turns we prayed and, and it was so heartfelt and so everything and then we went outside and we, we saw the stars and, and there were shooting stars and it was just a magical magical moment it was like there's no other way that that's humanly possible it's got to be jesus it's got to be everything that happens here is is jesus that he, he's done all this and it was just the the freedom of not having to think about the drugs like other people they would talk about it and they would you know i'm still you know i can't wait to get back and i can't wait to do it. i just say that, that doesn't did you happen. did you come to a realization of the cross at that point in time not not fully i don't think i think fully it it, it probably took probably took a good month and a half and when the and even even as far as like the you mean as far as what he did, as far as forgiveness? Yeah. That was, um, yeah. Was Him a, for us. His, you know, he took our sin. So that yeah, I would say that would be about a, a good month and a half there. And it just, the, Stephen, he was uh, one of the leaders there. And he, he did a lot of Bible studies. And, and he talked a lot about the elect and, and how, you know, the sins past, present, and future were forgiven. And I'd heard that before, but I never I really understood it. And just the one Bible study where he really put it into play like you know your sins are literally forgotten like he doesn't they were doesn't all placed them. on Christ and he, he was crucified yeah. as if he were the sinner and Christ. like your your uh, your cravings your everything else that that's all included it's like it's not something that you know should surprise you you didn't just pay for almost all of your sins or part of your sins or maybe the ones you did yesterday and not the day before, all that sort of thing. Right. It was literally paid for everything. One sacrifice for sins yeah. forever and then he sat down. Yeah. And that's why you're able to have what you have now. Because it still kind of didn't make any sense to me. Like I was still, you know, expecting that four year period of, of struggles, right? Like I was still planning on going through that battle, but I, I was just, everybody would talk about how they still have struggles and temptations that I don't know I just don't have it's it gone. like well you might get it when you get home and not really it's you know I've had dreams freedom and joy but that's it you like, had what I've had dreams of you know where I, I would go to use or whatever and oh, okay. I would wake up in terror like, like no, that's, no no that's no, the worst thing that's there. the last thing I want to do and but then I would talk to people so that that's a common theme it, it does happen but that's the closest I've came to craving. It's just in a dream world. But I mean, my Praise God. waking up is just like, no, wait. Okay, good. I'm free. Yeah, so I'm free. still here with my life. <laughs> Everything is fine. Wow. You know? Wow. And, so uh, I'm sure your prayers are full of thanksgiving oh, absolutely. and praise. And you yeah. often look at your life and just be like, how in the world can yeah. I ever be free? Well, and how, how could I ever go back? Yeah. Like there's literally, there's, there's nothing... There's nothing that can that can make me escape where I am now. Like, mm -hmm. There's just nothing. There's there's nothing that the carnal world has to offer that would even come close to two days or even half a day of, of what what the gospel has for me. Amen. But I just wanted to actually just sure go back a little further. That uh, where I kept on asking everyone to go home, right? And nobody was allowing it. And I had a conversation with John Dyke and a conversation with Tony, Tony yeah. and it was just not going anywhere. Just not going anywhere. And it, that was, from what I understand, that that was God's way. Of, showing me not to rely on man man got me out there but man wasn't going to bring me back it was until 
there was until just before I left, and there was uh, we watched a sermon, Dave Jeremiah, really good sermon, and um, so it really hit home to like whatever you need to ask Jesus, like he he says it quite a few times, you know, whatever you ask you, you know, he'll give you, and if you if you have an earnest heart in it. And so I really wanted to go home. I really wanted to go home. I went into my room and I just knelt down and I cried and I, I, I just asked them, you know, if there's anything possible. I know they don't know my heart, but you know my heart. You know my future. You know what I'm going to do. You know what I'm capable of, what I'm not capable of. You know my limits, everything. You know me better than I do. If there's any way possible for me to be able to go home, can you make this happen for mm. me? I'm asking and I'm begging you. Make this happen. And it just so happened with that, Within uh, a couple hours, I called my kids, and my Eric had found some money at home that I didn't even know I had. It turns out that was the exact amount for a plane ticket. Uh, one of our Bible study leaders, he gave me a little bit of money before I left. That was just enough, like, exactly to get my luggage on the plane. Like, everything was to the dollar. Really? Like, there was, like, maybe 80 cents or 60 cents left over. But it was God showing me that if I ask Jesus, I will get what I need. Not what I want, but I'll get what I need. And not to rely on man, to rely on Him for all wow. of my life. And so that's how I was able that's to get home. Not, home. They never they never got me home at all. No, it was, in fact, was, we were thinking that you were rebelling of you know, going what we were quick, trying to help right? you, yeah, right? Exactly, and I, I could see that, but it was just that was not going to happen. God was doing something outside yeah. of our yeah, intentions it's here. It's kind of like when right? Peter got you know put into prison. And they're all praying, and they, you know, he comes back, and they're like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" And yeah. they, they, the, the girl actually runs back and yeah. says, hey, "Peter's at the door," and they're like, "You're, You're crazy!" Full of it. <laughs> yeah. And then he comes yeah. walking in, like, yeah. "I'm here." And that was kind of the same way when I came home too. Like they weren't, ex they weren't necessarily expecting me, even though I called them. We knew you were, were coming. They're all in like, shock. Oh, they're no. like, you know, and even with my wife too, she's like, you know. But then all I had to do was just show them what God did for me, you yeah. know, what God did in my life. And, and it wasn't easy at first, you know, there was still some, you know, and I, I can still see, you know, people are still watching for that yeah. you know, left guy to come out or right guy or whatever to come out, but it's just not going to happen. So it's okay. Like, they can look all they want and just yeah. see God's glory. That's it. Well, keep so. sharing the truth with people. Tell people about Jesus. Yeah. He's dead. He was dead and he's raised again. And that's, that's what frees us yeah. from our sin and from Absolutely. our old self, right? Yeah, it's been a pleasure, awesome man. Journey. Thank you so much. God bless. Yeah.